welcome to Blood, Sweat and Deers. Uh, it's been quite a while since we've done a podcast. Uh, this is podcast number six. And I'm really fortunate to have as our guest tonight, uh, Mark Taroski, uh, artisan knife maker from um, Suffolk. Uh, Mark, we've met a couple of times. Once when I came yeah. to the workshop and once when we stalked a few weeks back. Um, how are you? Very well. Yeah, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. We're getting back to some form of normality. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm not into football, but it's a big night for football. By the time this goes out, we will either be um, doing very well within the football or we'll be knocked out by the Germans. But um, yeah, we'll right. see. Yep. But, uh, loving the backdrop. It's a lot better than mine, that workshop is, isn't it? it looks so oh, good, yeah. yeah. Borrowed that, have you? That's it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how's business? Uh, yeah, good. So far, so good. Yeah. Taking yeah. On. How have you got on throughout the uh, the pandemic with business? Has that help you expand because people are at home spending money or is it, how's it been? I, I don't really have anything to go by because uh, I, I basically started professionally uh, as we were going into lockdown, basically. Um, so it's all I've known as a, as a business. Really? So yeah. you started in 2014, if I remember. Yep, yep, about that's then, when yep. you and how did you start? How did you get into knife making the craft that it is? Um, in its most basic form, really, it was just um rehandling other knives. Um I think I think the the, the, the catalyst was seeing um dear Ray Mears on the telly box. Yep. Um and he, he he handled a knife basically in one of his programs. He had a he had a little knife made up by a blacksmith, and he put the handle on it, and it sort of clicked, I suppose. Then that uh, how accessible it was, you know. Before then, it seemed like a bit of a dark art, um, you know, something you have to go and learn or, or something. But there there he is, uh, just you know, making up a, a handle as he goes on the telly. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I went out to the shed and I had a, one of these Mora knives with the, you know, the plastic Mora yeah, knife I know handle. Mora knives. I, I used them for years. I always like orange, remember, and Mora did oh, yeah. handled yeah. Mora knife. Always, they were reasonable priced. If you lost them, you weren't going to get upset about it. And they did an orange or uh, an orange end to one of them. And I used to, I used to buy them by the box, to be honest. And a lot of the lads that we trained in the old days, they used to borrow uh, the, the Mora knives, and then the bar one of us for six or seven quid, you know. Uh, yeah. But anyway, sorry, yeah, the Mora. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not knocking a Mora knife in no. any way. They're, they're they're great for for their price and what they do. Um, so I took the lump hammer to it and smashed it off, which was actually quite a bit of a task. Um, they're quite well made, actually. Well, the old ones were anyway. Yeah, but um, yeah, and then um stuck my own wooden handle on it basically and yeah. just used what tools I had which at that time was one old rasp and some really cheap sandpaper um mm. and that that was it that was it really yeah. yeah and and that's where the love came yeah it's just having having a finished well a, a loose a loose term finished product yeah at the end of it that yeah, yeah, fair play. I, you know, I didn't have anything to do with the blade. Yeah. Um, but I turned that into a knife, which is, yeah. you know, a blade and a handle is yeah, a yeah. knife. Um, so, yeah, there's it, definitely like a satisfaction which came from it. Yeah. yeah. So so what were you doing then? What were you working as then? And then how did it go from being um, a, a an idea to a hobby to then um, the lovely workshop that I saw near Bury St Edmunds, uh, you've got all the kit and you're turning out the incredible pieces of workmanship that you are at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, well, back then, uh, I was actually living down in Devon uh, for a few years uh, with my now wife. Um, we moved down there for her, really, for work. She got a job uh, in Plymouth. Yeah. Um, and I, I was a freelance tree surgeon and, you know, tree worker, groundsman. Um, so it was easy for me because like th those are transferable skills that you can take yes. anywhere around the country. Yeah. Um, so, so while we were down there, that's what I was doing as a, uh, subcontracted tree surgeon. Um, yeah. 
which was great because I had, you know, obviously an inexhaustible supply of wood. Uh, uh, but it meant I wasn't that, um, that that good when we went to do firewood because every other log, I you know, had to stop yeah. and have a look. That's a nice piece of beach. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. And see if it had any, you know, spalting or any character in it. Do, do you know, I was, uh, years ago, I... Um, and it is years ago, uh, it, so it must have been in probably the 90s, I sent away to a woman who had, did a kit on um, carving your own decoy. And you got this oh, yeah. Of, yeah, block, I think it was, I think it was birch, actually, the wood that you got, because that's quite easy to whittle. And, this, and uh, you got this kit and a rough diagram and a few tools and everything with it. And I think it was maybe even bought me as a birthday. And I had this idea because I was, in those days, I was out really into my duck shooting and going up on the foreshore with a group of keeper mates. And um, so I had this idea to craft my own decoy. And it's still, it's still an idea. And on that yeah. bookshelf is a two or three, you know, American decoy books. Right. Never did it, but but any time I see a block of wood, right? I, think, yeah, yeah, I always yeah. think, oh, do you know that's like that would make a de- good decoy, but I still haven't <laughs> done it. Probably yeah. never will, but it it was a thought that counted. But anyway, yes. So carry yeah, on. Yeah. You've got these bits of wood. Uh, uh, where were we? Yeah, yeah. So that that was what I was doing at the time. Yeah. Uh, tree surgery. Um, we decided just uh, organically that that we sort of had our time down in Devon. Uh, yeah. So we, uh, this is as we were sort of planning to get married and it just felt like we wanted to move back um, to Suffolk, which is where we were both from originally. Yeah. Um, so when we moved back, um, I started working more in grounds care, um, yeah. sort of probably 50-50 grounds care and tree work, but more for myself. Uh, so I started up more as my own company, my own business. Yeah. Um, again, loose term because it was basically me. And then um, <laughs> yeah. I roped in someone every now and again. Um, yeah. uh, but that sort of gave me the flexibility to explore other avenues, uh, mm-hmm. one of which being uh, a bit more knife making on the side, uh, where we were living at the time, had access to quite a nice uh, empty, but quite a nice workshop space. Um, so purely as a hobby uh i started getting more into the knife making again at the time it was buying in pre-made uh like, pre-made knives yeah. And, and, yeah. and sticking handles on um which you know it, obviously as a professional that's that that you do, you do half the job i suppose um so i couldn't call myself a knife maker at the time yeah but it yeah. gives you like i was able to focus on those aspects of knife making yeah. like yeah. The handle part. exactly yeah like yeah. how to finish wood you know uh, back then i was using like leather uh, to add little spaces and things so like yeah. how how to finish leather you know to a, to a nice standard um what to do but more, more importantly like what not to do yeah like yeah. what ruins a good yeah. handle yeah. Uh, which it's is quite in- interesting uh, because a few weeks back we were in the Birmingham Gun Quarter and we were with a guy who, um, oh, a fantastic guy, Malcolm Crookston, uh, and, and over the door it says stocker, so piece of wood and everything, but he obviously yeah. he's a um, little bit older than me, he should have retired, but still um, um, doing his craft there. And, you know, like he started off as a stocker, so that would have been really all about the wood, wouldn't it? You know, so he would have yeah, affected yeah, yeah. the wood as an apprentice and through his age. And then that, obviously, you have to then fix that to the metal and that brings in the gun side. And now Malcolm does everything, of course. Sure. Um, yeah. And uh, but it would be an interesting, sort of how you've done that as well, is you kind of started it off and you were unashamedly said to me when I came over, I'm the YouTube generation, so I thought, is he a... A craft apprentice has he done this as he done? but you've actually you've took yourself taught aren't you and it's driven by passion and interest and everything and uh, yeah. i think it's amazing you know I've, I've got a couple of your knives um and um you can't help but when you actually look at it the detail and uh, smaller detail you know but but actually the the blade and how the handle fits in your hand that you really have 
you know, um, took it yourself and made it your own, if you know what I mean. So yeah, yeah, yeah. not the knife, but your craft and your skill. So uh, yeah. yeah. Um, brilliant. Yeah, I think, I think obviously the YouTube thing is, you know, a pinch of salt yeah. and it, it sounds like I've got it completely wrong. Oh, well, no, no, no. It, it's, I think it's just important that, um, it, that makes it perhaps sound easy. Yeah. Um, if, you know, if you go onto YouTube and search how to make a knife, uh, you know, there's a thousand different videos and not everyone is particularly correct. Yeah. Or applicable to what you're doing, how you want to do it. Um, so you, you, you're just, you're fishing, you know, for like little yeah. snippets of information. You've still got uh, to turn that, you've still got to yeah. turn that film into practical skill, which is the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be a yeah. grolicking video, couldn't it? Exactly, you know, yeah, yeah. Show you how to do it all and everything. But then actually yeah. turning that into a, a good field grolic, you know what I mean? Or, you know, in your case, a, you know, a, an incredible knife, it, it, it's, it's easier said than done, isn't it, you know? Yeah, so you just, like I say, you're taking snippets of the information that uh, has sparked something for you that, you know, yeah. that you think that you could take forward. Uh, and then that's where the, the real work begins, I suppose, and that you have to, you know, do actual research and development uh, and on that idea and put it into practice. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, bet, I bet that was when you started realising I need this and I need that and I need a bit more than my chainsaw and, a, <laughs> and, uh, and, and some chisels and some sandpaper. I bet you need to... So like yeah, it gets invested. to a point where it gets to the point where you have to decide which way are you going with this. And it, at the same time, it was exactly the same for my to take this up a level and join. You know, do I want to spend ten thousand pounds, say, on a chipper, and another ten thousand pounds on a vehicle to ramp up that business? Yep. Do I want to? spend the equivalent money on the knife making and because there's just certain things you just can't do without the the proper equipment yeah um yeah. well certainly not efficiently you know enough to make it uh, worthwhile in terms of any sort of income yeah um so at some point you have to bite the bullet and decide you know what equipment you you need to go forwards yeah. What are your what are your key investments in 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 that? I, I think I was there. You got a you got an oven, hadn't you? Yeah, that was a is it an oven a kiln? Yeah, the, the the main two pieces of equipment in anyone's sort of any knife maker's arsenal would be the the heat treatment and the the grinding, the yeah. shaping, and like pretty pretty much universally across the knife making world, that's a a two by seventy two inch belt uh, grinder. I mean, it's, it's effectively it's a liner shirt or a sander. Yeah. Um, but for whatever reason, us knife makers call it a, a grinder. Yeah. And and yeah, the heat treatment. Um, so that'd be a heat treating kiln and like as a side companion to that, some sort of tempering oven. Yeah. Which you've well. now all got in that workshop behind you, haven't you? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's here. So, and 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 once you got that, obviously, I bet your productivity went up more then, didn't it? With a you know a bit more efficient then. Yeah, it that 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 is just like the turning point then of being a knife maker because you yeah. you can't make a knife without heat treating it or no. even obviously the first the first stage would be shaping a piece of metal into a knife shape. Yeah. Um. So up until then, you're just relying on pre-made the pre-made hand uh, knife blanks yeah and you're just fitting that which, which you're buying in so so I've been, so that is that is the turning point of of becoming you know a knife maker yeah from, from start to finish i mean obviously you can you can do it uh, uh in a different way if you've got a forge uh, a little propane forge or something where you you know you're heating up metal in that and then quenching it to harden it um, but for any sort of consistency, really, that you need to be investing in, you know, in this equipment to, to get consistent results. It really is like baking a cake, like recipes. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, plus or minus five degrees centigrade, uh, yeah. it makes a massive amount of difference to the end product. Yeah. So you need to, you need to be able to trust, 
trust yourself in the equipment that you're, you're, you're giving the customer what, what, what they deserve, really. Yeah, and from looking at your website now, you've established set patterns, which are your Mark Zabrowski knife, haven't you? And, um, and, and, and um, you know, a selection of different models that you prefer to make. Which, how's, how does that go um, with regards to, say, somebody wanted to order that? Would they just look? And, and I noticed when I first got to know you, there used to be quite a few knives uh, up for sale, but it seems um, following your Instagram, they kind of come and go, don't they, very quickly. So um, you can either buy one from the shop that you've got online or yeah. you would possibly um, for the person who is invested in that um, uh, knife, you'd want to make it bespoke and, and have a bit of a say in what the different finish, the wood or, or the shape of the blade would be, wouldn't you? Yeah, it, that's just been like an organic uh, progression, really. In the, as, as more orders uh, have come in and my sort of wait list has increased, I, I can't really justify taking time off of that to make knives just to sell, you know, on, on the website to, to anyone. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I have to be fair to my customers that are waiting, you know. Yeah. Um, um, although obviously I control and it's like a self-imposed uh, waiting time. You know, I could say a year's time and I could give myself some leeway to make extras yeah. uh, to stock the website. But um, if someone's taken the time to contact me and, and they want to, you know, invest their money on one of my products and I just want to get it out to them as timely as possible. Well, you know, which is my favourite, and I'm just holding holding it up and showing for anybody on video uh, what it is. But if you're listening, um, you won't be able to see this, but it's a short, um, uh, that's your smallest of your knives, isn't it? And it's... Uh, yeah. Pocket Hunter. Pocket, st- pocket Hunter, that I, that I keep calling the... struggling. Pocket Stalker. And you can see uh, Mark very kindly, still got a bit of grolic on it, Mark. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> we do use our products. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can see uh, our logo on there, which is very kind of you to put on. And also on the other side, your logo. Can I just get that right? Yeah, there you go. Oh, it's back to front because it's on the. Uh, no, the that's good. Webcam. That's you it, can yeah. see it, but uh, how do you get that? How do you how do you get that into there? Is that engraved? How does that work? Uh, so I use, uh, which is the 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 common and traditional way of doing it, knife makers, which is called electro etching. Yeah. Um, so you basically you use a stencil, which uh, electronically insulates or conducts certain areas. Obviously, your stencil design uh, yes. that's conductive, yes. yeah. um, and the rest of it is is it's usually a, a vinyl type material, so that insulates it from the cu- electric current. Uh, then you, you you're using electricity and uh, a solution, an electrolyte solution. Yeah to force it basically like force rusts yeah but very quickly so it eats away at the surface uh so you're left with an actual depression uh you know you run your fingernails across it and you can feel that it's catching yeah and uh for this one in particular what i really like is this um well i'm going to call it plastic plastic case that you've heat shrunk onto it yeah Uh, fits it really snugly and um, again, it just isn't attached to my belt. It really fits in the, the pocket on my uh, on my thigh. Um, the Merkel trousers, a lot of the German trousers have that knife pocket already. I'm so I'm blessed to have yeah, that, yeah. and uh, and that just fits in perfectly. And it's uh, well, it's just become my go-to knife. And I um, I'm giving it some stick. To be yeah, good. Yeah, that's what it's for, really. Yeah, it is. It is. And I designed that one. You know, as you say, it hasn't got a belt loop. Obviously, you, if you want it with a belt loop, and yeah. I, uh, that's its most basic version. Yeah. Um, which is designed as a companion knife. Uh, so it's a companion knife to your main stalking knife, and you can use that little one for the heavy work. You know, if you want to go for your ribs on your roe deer and your muntjac, that would do it fine. And you can save your yeah, and you can save your nice knife for you know for doing your growlicking and and whatnot. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great product. And um, and and which one do you? So that's my favourite. What you, you know, you're the actual knife maker. What's your favourite one? Which is yours? Yeah, when you were out with us a few weeks ago, you had the um, fin and feather, which was um, 
Yeah, yeah. Very well, slick I, and... Yeah. Uh, I can't... Yeah. Obviously, it's like choosing your favourite child. Yeah. Not that I, I don't have any first-hand experience of that. But, um, yeah, the, I don't, I've got the fin and feather. Just I've got mine here. Just because it's... Um, I just find it a little bit more elegant and I've gone for like a gentleman's knife. Uh, yeah. You know, it's quite dainty, yeah. uh, long and thin. Um, and and to me, it's like the sort of knife that you would have seen around a hundred years ago, like yeah. it hasn't really aged. No. Uh, and that, that's something that's always in the back of my mind, I suppose, is is how, how these knives will look, you know, in a hundred years time. What's the handle on that one? It's it's a uh, water handle for those. Who yeah, so this is um this is red deer. Is it red deer antler? Yeah, okay. it's been stabilised. So all the uh, all the inside, all the marrow type stuff you get inside has all been filled with resin. Yeah, uh, but they take a really nice high polish once you get through the uh, through the yeah. outer bark. They they take a lovely polish. So yeah, I wouldn't be using that to take the arse out of a stag though. With it's far too nice. That is, I'd be using that knife for like cutting up um, this bresciola, this like little oh, yeah. I've been making. Yeah, onto a nice chopping board. Nice knife. Looks nice and impressive. This is yeah. the yeah, this is the backside job. This one. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know they're all stainless steel. Yeah, uh, all the handles are stabilized. Yeah. Uh, so apart from you know getting a little bit of tarnish on the copper perhaps in the brass um you know they're just they're just as practical as a as a synthetic handle when i wrote an article about this um a few months ago for sporting shooter and i i mentioned the stabilizing in that when you say it just so for the listeners you know who are interested in this you stabilize wood you stabilize horn and bone so what you basically do you you remove the the, the liquid that's in there and replace it with a resin so it's you know um it, it doesn't expand or crack under when it's getting wet and used yeah yeah and basically any material that is like naturally porous, porous yeah um would act like a sponge so um if you have unstabilized wood and use that for a knife handle uh so certain woods are almost naturally stable uh like a desert ironwood is so dense that you basically can't stabilize it because you can't force any resin into it. Um, but we haven't, uh, is, we haven't got much desert iron within the Chilterns. No, <laughs> no, not anymore. No, but um, uh, so any 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 naturally porous wood without stabilization, even humidity from the air, you know, would get drawn into it, and that's why you see a lot of like. A lot of the knives that you would have had as a child, if you still got them, uh, with unstabilised woods, chances are from being even sitting in your drawer at home, yeah, uh, yeah. they would soak up moisture, and that's when yeah. they start to peel away. The yeah. handle material will start to peel away from. The I remember blade. it. I yeah. used to have one of those um, uh, folding knives with a rosewood handle and like the old traditional yeah, yeah. brass bolsters in it. Yeah, everyone's had one of those. I know they have. You know. And I, yeah. um, but I think with mine, one of the pieces fell off the side. I mean, yeah. it, it was just, I think I probably put it in the dishwasher years ago, but you know what I mean? But it which, which probably was my fault. But again, um, probably wasn't stabilised, probably made in China. And uh, yeah, it is what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the stabilisation is you basically, yeah, you put it in a vacuum chamber, submerse it in a resin, which sets under heat. So once... You've uh, once you've sucked all the air bubbles out of the wood and replaced it with the resin. Yeah, uh, that takes you know for the DIYer like myself, I would include myself in that. Is that that takes quite a long time? You know, literally a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, I would leave it for a week under vacuum, um, and then a week at ambient, you know, at ambient pressure, just to make yeah. sure it's fully yeah. soaked in. Um, yeah, then you you wrap it in um, uh, uh, some aluminium foil and bung it in the in a normal sort of uh, oven, domestic oven. Yeah, and yeah. that that heat cures that next resin. To your, and next to your pasty. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've got to use the energy while it's there, <laughs> and you can't waste it. Which is which is the uh, is there a um, a material as uh, you know an organic material that's 
difficult to deal with. You have to work with somebody think, oh, God, somebody's asked me for, I don't know, walrus tusk or God knows what. You know what I mean? That, that maybe there's a nightmare to stabilise or is, are they all, is it just, it is what it is? And it's yeah, all- the, I mean, they've all got their quirks, definitely. And you'll have to, you have to treat them all individually. Um, like you've got practical ones that are like practically awkward, uh, like antler, because yep. obviously it, it's cylindrical, so you've got no flat surfaces to work from. Yeah. Um, you know, you buy in, you buy in a block of wood, and it's perfectly right angles, um, and it's true. Yes. Uh, so you just whiz it on the bandsaw, and you've got two equal, you know, pieces of material. But there's a lot of messing about uh, with antler, and again, like bone and horn if you're doing it from the raw material just because yeah. you've got you, you've got no uh, equal surface to work from no. initially but, um so there's yeah it's just messing about time yeah um, which obviously adds a bit of cost unfortunately but yeah, but, time yeah. Money. but i mean i mean the one i'm using and the uh, the accompanying knife with it have got this um uh this g10 like, yeah g10 like a laminate um yeah. And I did when 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 you first sent it to me, I did actually um, Google the G10. It's actually well, if you look at it, you can catch it in the light. It's like a it's a material with it that's been soaked yeah, in the, yeah, yeah. Like the old. You can stuff. see the like yeah, it's like woven woven layers. Yeah. Of uh, well, the G10, the any that's entirely synthetic. So you have like a synthetic woven fabric, uh, and lots of layers of that built up sandwich between resin yeah so that's like 100 percent synthetic and then you've got like a slightly more natural version of that called micarta yeah uh, which is the same theory but you're using natural woven fabrics instead yeah and then what you choose to do that with affects like the the characteristics um so you can use uh, a canvas micarta which is obviously quite rough so so your layers uh, are a lot chunkier and as you Oh, so I think the Wi-Fi is playing. Come back, Mark. Oh, there you are. The coarseness of that. I'm here. Am I here? Yeah. Good. I think uh, I think there's a, a Frisian walk uh, past your Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, right. Um, yeah, and the other end of the spectrum would be like a paper. So you can they literally use paper sandwiched up in lots of layers between resin, and that takes a very high gloss finish, which almost looks like a horn once it's once it's done. Wow. So so lots of choice for handles, lots of choice yeah, for yeah, of shapes, course. and uh, and uh, business is going well at the moment. So far, so good. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. That's really great to hear from like 2000 volts or seven years. You've progressed to that. And, you know, the workshop that we came to um, last year in the autumn when we could see each other um, yeah. was very impressive. Lovely, that lovely rural location. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think what I also liked um, was the, the, the box it was presented in and even down to your little logo. I mean, you explained to me at the time what the logo was, but that went back to your school days, didn't it, when you were doing potato pressings or something, was it? <laughs> yeah, almost. Uh, no, that, that just came from, um, it's, obviously, it's just a, a monogram of my, of my main initials. It's yeah. just an M and a Z overlapping. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, like, like I said, that we, we were tasked at uh, middle school, I think, to come up with, um, come up with our signature you know that we wanted to use because at some point you have to decide you know you yeah. have to make some sort of script yeah. on, a, on a piece of paper and that's you somehow but um yeah I was obviously feeling quite artistic and I came up with this uh prince like monogram of my name uh but I wasn't allowed to keep that so <laughs> really good really interesting right let's move off from knife making because I was re- really Really interesting. I'm sure for the listeners it was too. You, you you make all these knives. I know you like your field sports, but uh, what are you? What, what's what are you into? What are you? Are you, are you a shooter? Are you a stalker? Are you both terrier man ferreter? What, what what's? I know nothing about that other than you've been stalking with me. But do you? What do you like? Yeah, mostly now. Now it's pretty much exclusively the deer uh, that I'm really interested in. Um, 
I think like a lot of people, I progressed naturally uh, from shotgunning to rifle shooting. Yeah. Uh, just just because that's what most people do. You know, you apply for your your, your uh, shotgun certificate when you're 18 or whatever. And then you mess about for a few years doing some pigeon shooting and and beaters days pheasants and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but my my main interest always was deer and deer stalking and you know hunting. Um, but oh. I actually only got my rifle certificate a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, for no other reason than it, I just didn't get around to doing it. Um. And I wanted to do my DSC one and all that sort of stuff, and uh, just because of work and, and life in general, I just didn't get around to doing it. No, because um, I've always been like really passionate about it. It felt like I was in training for all of that time. You know, uh, yeah. I got all the books. You know, and and uh, th- you know things on TV were driven by my love of uh, you know the countryside and deer. So were you going out? Were you going out with a friend then, uh, who was into that and had got some ground? Is that how you got into it? Um, no, not really. Um, obviously, I'm a bit of an adult onset hunter. You know, it came to me, you know, quite late, even though the interest was there. Yeah. Uh, but there, there was no one really in my uh, like immediate family or yeah. my immediate surroundings that were really into it. Um, I would say like my childhood was fairly conventional. Like we grew up on the edge of a housing estate, like yeah. near the fields. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, and and it, it's almost like you're the weird one, you know, and the quirky one at the family. And uh, you know, they, obviously, they came to the point where I had to ask my mother if, if she'd be right with me applying for my shotgun certificate. You know, and we lived on this how you know, albeit fairly nice housing estate, and. Yeah. You know, you, you feel a bit odd. Yeah, um, I can completely relate to this. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and it's difficult, and yeah, but you just have to, um, you just have to make the opportunities yourself. Yeah. Um, and and I think the main, well, at college, I studied countryside management. Um, so that's basically like countryside rangering skills. Yeah. Uh, so it's a little, it's quite broad and it's a little bit of everything. Um, and obviously that's where I got my chainsaw experience to then go on and do tree surgery. Yeah. Um, but, but from that we did, uh, we had to do a day's work experience, uh, one day per week. And I did mine with the national trust, uh, a, lo- a local estate to, to Berry to Berry St. Edmunds, um, but they've got a lot of woodland and they had um, uh, they had a volunteer deer stalking team yep. there. Um, so I was, I was volunteering with the rangers as they were at the time. Uh, was, unfortunately, the National Trust has changed a lot since then and um, they're barely rangers anymore. But um, I was with them and uh, very like very wanting to go and see what all this deer stalking was about because you know back then I had the passion um and the want to do it but you you just have to seek out these opportunities yourself um you know so I I sort of went and started talking to the deer stalkers there um and that was my first experience of actually going out uh deer stalking and um it was like it wasn't the best experience um uh i was very ill prepared for the early morning cold yeah uh, <laughs> um but um yeah that was my that was my first experience it didn't put me off in any way no but it was just uh, it was just a long time since then that i was able to to, to take it further really yeah, it's funny um, if you say that. You just I'm I'm comparing myself and how I got into shooting. Yeah, and I, I was I was a lad working on a pig farm that um, because of circumstances I ended up befriending uh, the gamekeeper and was really interested. It kind of suddenly I met somebody who from a kid I was always out bird nesting and uh, 
um, they can't go back in time and do you for this, can you? But I was always out down looking no, for no. stuff like that, you know, and hawks and owls and all that, you know. And then I met this guy who was like, uh, you know, older but similar to me, and he had this, you know, his incredible, knowledgeable um, countryman, a guy called Pete Cromack. Uh, he's retired now, but mm -hmm. he, he really ignited everything in me my family weren't into field sports or yeah, many, yeah. you know what I mean I, the, the nearest I got to that was me you know me my granddad having cockerels hung up in the coal shed and and, and and keeping pigeons for food as well you know what I mean it was, it was yeah so I kind of I, I kind of knew about that I lived in a village you know it was a farming community and all that and I I used to help this gamekeeper used to walk up there and uh, and he was the guy that kind of prompted me to apply for my shotgun as soon as I could and was you know very diligent on you know, training me with that, you know, I can remember the times he wouldn't let me um, even have cartridges in it. I just had to carry it and break it over fences and stuff like that. And, you yeah, know, yeah. off around the ear roll was a reminder that I was doing something wrong or he wouldn't let me use it for a couple of weeks. And then I kind of used to help him. And then like on a Sunday afternoon, I'd get let to do something like pigeon shooting or rabbiting or as I walked back across the fields to my village, I'd shoot a squirrel or something like that. And it was really, you know, I'd shoot a rabbit and think, well, am I meant to do this? And it was, it was all kind of oh, self-taught, but, you know. Yeah, it was, yeah, that's it. But, yeah, and so it's a little similar thing, really, those people that, and, and, you know, thank God I did meet him because I don't know how I would have ended up because I've had always had this passion for wildlife, birds, you know, the, the countryside around me and now in my job, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Throughout the UK and, and Europe. And, you know, I've got just outside behind that curtain, he's like five feeders and I've got young goldfinches coming to him and I just, just can't help myself. It's that kind of passion. And I think like these National Trust guys, they must have ignited and helped you you know, um, you know, satisfy that, so to speak. And that takes you to the next level, doesn't it? Like me with the shotgun, like you with the shotgun. Then I was helping yeah, yeah. foxes. I applied for a 2-2. Two -two. I had this little old marlin underleave like a cowboy's gun. Yeah, yeah. shot millions of bullets through that. And I, I, I would say in those days, I was a lot, I trained a lot more to shoot with a 2-2 two -two off sticks on rabbits and stuff like that. Right, yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's, and, and, yeah. A few podcasts. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah like you say it was definitely like the catalyst, and and you're almost just waiting for some sort of door to open. Yeah, you know, once it does, you can, you know, you kick it open the rest of the way, and you and you're there really, yeah. and then it's just keeping the momentum going uh, because it's probably quite easy to to drop out of this sort of lifestyle. Yeah, um, I yeah, think yeah, it's, I think it's harder. Us, get, I think it's harder to get that door open and to find those people. Uh, yeah yeah you know, definitely uh, but a lot of that a lot of that comes with like trust yeah and and when when you're unfortunately when you're not in the the country sports world um it, it is seen it's quite a clandestine sort of secret you know Odd, oh, odd little place, really, that you just you just sort of glimpse. Isn't it? The deer stalking world, and the, everybody wants your ground. Everybody wants to stab you in the back. It's bloody horrible. <laughs> yeah, but so it's just gaining gaining the right people. People's You're a trust. Man's men with your friends, but anybody outside of that, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> so I think. But that's perhaps me as an old bloke. <laughs> But yeah, you know, possibly, yeah. yeah, back to the subject. You're lucky if you can find somebody who'll take you under the wing and give you that kind of, you know, um, you know, knowledge and, and you know, it's um, the, yeah, it's just the foot in the door. The craft, I it? suppose it is, isn't it? it you know, yeah, yeah. Knowing the countryside and all the things and how it all fits together. Um, yeah, I, 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 I've just been away this weekend and I downloaded the farm with. Um, oh God, blimey. Oh, Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy on it, and up in the and his ground's not far from ours. And it's, okay, it's, yeah, I've yeah. watched two or three of them, and um, and then I, I looked onto his uh, social media feed to see what reaction he was getting. And, like everybody's you know, raving about it. I think they're actually learning how difficult farming and how living in the countryside and actually making yeah, some yeah. money out of it. Um, it really is you know i mean I, I think it's great that he's, he's putting it over his version of it but certainly for people to understand uh, you know crop rotation how you plant crops how you how the weather impacts on everything you do and all that you know um 
I've gone off the tangent, sorry. but No, that's fine. No, I, I haven't seen any of it, but I, we, obviously we definitely need more more things like this out there, you know, more, more yeah. accessible I, I, I think people helps. that are willing to show it. It helps. It's obviously him, and he's got a huge platform to launch it on there, but he hasn't gone in there as an expert saying this is how you do it. He's literally got the, uh, the local land agent um, and uh, a, a local farm contractor and and all local people helping him, and they just think he's a, <laughs> comes. They're just like, what? You know, <laughs> think he's a complete idiot. But from it, he's kind of learning. But it is hilarious uh, in the errors he's making. But right, yeah. I would. I think year three he might even start to break even. But he's probably getting about ten million pounds for actually making it off Amazon. But um, sure. the actual yeah. farm itself, oh goodness, he's he's making a few mistakes. Anyway, again, carry on. <laughs> Uh, where were we? Uh, yeah, so yeah, National Trust. Yeah, that, that like uh, was the door opening for me, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, and then literally there, I was doing uh, you know rabbit shooting with my two two air rifle um, and stuff like that. Um, it, that was the enabler for me um, to then start meeting people and networking and yeah. and whatnot. Um, as I say, like most people, apply for my shotgun certificate. Um, but then, yeah, like, as I say, just just from work and career uh, choices and moving around, it, it was very late. Um, like I say, it was only a couple of years ago now that I've got my uh, rifle uh, certificate all sorted. What did you? What was your choice, what was your choice of rifle? Uh, so three hundred eight. Good, um, good choice. <laughs> and uh, I went for Browning. Actually, yeah. uh, I went for Browning X Bolt. Um, with the thumb stock that they do, uh, it's called an eclipse. Yeah. Um, uh, I was doing a lot of high high seat shooting at yeah. the time. Um, pretty much as I uh, as I started, I, I started going out and, and helping just with some culling on the estate that I beat on. Yeah. Um, and it's exclusively high seat shooting from there. Yeah. Um, and it just felt. Uh, just the, the way that your wrist sits when you're holding your rifle in a high seat, it's yeah. just so much more comfortable with a thumb yeah. stock, at least yeah. for me, yeah. uh, the, just for the grip and stuff like that. Um, so uh, I, that was probably one of the driving factors of my rifle choice uh, was what was available in a thumb stock. I think that was a good choice. I, I started off with the Brown and A-Bolt about a million oh, yeah. years ago yeah and it, i can remember buying it from garlands and it came in a package i used to help out at garlands in those days so i had a, I had an account and the hours i did paid off what i did and yeah. uh, i mean this is a million years ago but but i had a browning a bolt wouldn't stop no um no um sound mods in those days and it came with a Swarovski scope and it came with a sling and a case and a gerber was it a gerber an old timer knife. And uh, so it came as a complete kit. And I think okay. it even came with um, federal ammunition. I think you got four boxes of federal. And they put this kit together, guys, and that's what you, you had. And I kind of had that and paid it off. But it was a 243 oh. at the time. And I shot a 243 for probably about 10 years. And I blooming loved it. And I most of my shooting them uh, in the early days was foxes helping gamekeepers and on the ground that are kind of farms and that I knew. And then um, I started shooting Muntjac and a few row in the Cotswolds. And then that went on from there. But the, uh, the, the change to 308 came from a, a guy called Andy Patmore, who I think is a retired, well, I know he's retired forest commission ranger um, at Rockingham forest. And I went out with him right. on some of his ground and he got this old BSA scout or whatever, you know, commission rifle or whatever it was. And yeah, um, yeah. and he said, well, you don't want a 243. I said, why not? He said, well, he says, you need a 308, kid. <laughs> I said, 308? I said, it's a cannon. He said, yeah, he said, it's a cannon. He says, but he says, he says um, it, for shooting in woodland, he said, you know, uh, he said it's a bigger bullet. Um, yeah. It's not so fast, not so um, prone to... Um, deflection uh, better bullet choice if you know if you get a muntjac and uh, and there's a little you know you don't see a twig in front of it because it's in cover because that's where it lives you know it's um, it's a bit more accepting of that you know than a two yeah, four, three yeah. and um and i actually shot a muntjac with him with this um with this um 
with his 308. And then later on, I shot one with my own 243. And the 308, it dropped it on the spot. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the 243, it ran into cover. It took us 15 minutes to find it. And I thought, you know what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, I went from 243 to 308. And uh, I've been a, a big advocate yeah. of that ever since. Yeah, the, the first center fire caliber I ever shot um, was a 270. Oh. Unmoderated. Yeah, uh, it was a lovely rifle. I can't remember the, the the make, but it was like a Stutzen full full, full stocked rifle. Um, so that was my only other experience of a centerfire before I shot the 308. Um, and uh, I did my DSC one uh, over with Jim Riley at Chippenham. Um, yeah. Really fantastic uh, layout he's got there for for doing the courses, and. Um, he he loves the 308 and and that's you know it's pretty much all they use there um and that's what we used because uh, at the time i didn't have my own rifle yeah. doing the yeah. dsc one so i used the estate rifle which was a blaza in 308 and again i, I that, that's all i had to go by at the time so in yeah. terms of like yeah. the, the kick and and everything like that that was just i, I didn't know any different and um and even now it, it doesn't I don't think there is one. You know, it doesn't bother me. No, well, uh, when I was younger, and the only the only real calibers that were off the shelf were two four three or two seventy, and any of the rangers or the guys that I got to meet or in Scotland, they were, they were all either shooting two four threes or two seventies. No, again, no sound moderators in those days. Uh, yeah. Hence my permanent tinnitus in this year, but that's another story. Uh, and. And then the occasional 308, and then of course there was the blooming watershed of, you know, 6.5s, all the different calibers that came in. Oh, 2506 yeah. had, I think, 10 years of, you know, um, popular attention. Is it a creed more now? You know, there's such a broad selection of yeah. calibers. I, I just want to um, ammunition and all that, but th- there wasn't that. Yeah, it, it's partly as well driven from the fact that I couldn't afford you know, or justify at least uh, having multiple rifles no. in different calibers. So I just wanted one, one solid round that would do that would cover everything that I would be doing. It's one of my, it's one of my m- most regularly asked questions, either with lads that are stalking, that are coming with us and use our estate rifles, and they're you know, like you were a few years ago, considering what you're going to use. Uh, yeah. or, or PMs through social media, you know, you always push the 308 OMY and, you know, it's, I mean, it just suits me and the, and, and the, 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 the environment that I, uh, I use in, which is woodland stalking, um, you know, shots up to regularly shooting out to 150 metres, but certainly not the long shots, perhaps of like the Welsh Hills for valleys or, or up into Scotland or, you know, so it suits, just suits us. And that's what, I, you know, I, I ask them straight away, well, what's, what are you shooting? And generally it's, you know, lowland woodland stalking. And, and I think it's, yeah. me personally, um, I think it's a good round. Um, yeah. Well, for around a hundred to 150 meters, uh, yeah. pretty much everything I've shot, like, you know, it drops on the spot more or less. Yeah. Like um, that robot the other night. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Just like that. Yeah. That was a very enjoyable evening. Uh, let's tell the listeners. Yeah. Um, so I invited Mark to shoot his first roebuck, <clears throat> and he had had all the had had other offers, but um, decided to take up mine. And uh, we we finally got a date that suited us, and we went out. So what is it now? It's the end of June now. So it was probably a couple of mid mid June, wasn't it? And it was yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So we've had quite a bit of hot weather, and it's just when the, we happened to time it on the night that the weather was about to break. So we had this incredible humidity, didn't we? It was ridiculous. Yeah, it was very Nothing hot. Wet, yeah. Nothing moved. The book I was after is still there. Um, but we managed to find a little cool book on um, some stewardship in amongst the flowers, didn't we? And a really nice stalk. Yeah, yeah. And what was that incredible rifle you were using? Oh, the Merkel K5. <laughs> Round of applause. Oh, I love that rifle. I am so biased. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a lovely little rifle, and oh. like, but as as you say, that that was my actually my first roebuck. Yeah. Um, just just out of happenstance that uh, most of my shooting ground around here, the row aren't in high numbers. No, um, so they tend well, 
the good places at least tend to just leave them be. Um, yeah. Obviously, like, there's some local populations where they do need hammering back. Um, but but for me, there just wasn't really the opportunity. Um, um, so the, there's been many that have been in my crosshairs that I've just watched, which has been lovely. Um, what have you got in it local to you? You've got fallow and, and lots of muntjac, haven't you? Yeah, really good muntjac population. Yeah. Um, a lot yeah. of fallow. That's why the um, road here aren't establishing so quickly. You know what I mean? I've, yeah, I've, yeah, possibly. Yeah, it's yeah. just localized little pockets. Um, yeah, and there's no there's there doesn't really seem to be many good roebuck around here. Like the genetics aren't very good at all. Um, but yeah, and other than that, there's like local localized populations of red. Obviously, we're not we're not far from uh, Thetford Forest sort yeah. of area. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously, all around Euston Estate. You know, they're they're, they're famous for their red deer. Yeah, um, and so that the, they come down and they touch. You know, the, they're mainly north of the A14. Yeah, uh, line from from where I am here, just just south of there. But um, yeah. yeah, so and there's not there's really a... good populations of roe. I, I I know there's a good popular population of roe in that direction and in Thetford. But that was where um, year, years ago they did the study in Kings Forest there on the Munchak. And that's where a lot of the information came from on that, if you know that. But it, a lot, right. it, like a 10 year, Norma Chapman uh, did a, 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 like a 10 year study. Norma Chapman and others um, did, a, did, a, did a 10 year study. So that would have been the 80s and into the 90s. And I think it was in the early noughties, they had like a Munchak symposium over there that I went over to. Uh, and it was all English Nature, Forestry Commission, uh, with the main players in it. And um, they were already saying, you know, you've got to shoot this species on site. This is mm. 20 years ago. You know, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's getting um, distribution is just incredibly fast. It was assisted by others, of course. You know, everybody was catching them and shifting them and moving them and, Keep mates, right. with, you know, lending them to the mates in another county, but yeah, you yeah. Can just see how the the the, um, the 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 distribution map, the holes were filling up, muntjac were appearing everywhere. And you know, twenty years ago, we didn't have, we had a, the, an occasional muntjac in Staffordshire, but now right. they're here, and you know, you see them knocked down on the roads. There's not really such a population that you could stalk them like you could perhaps Oxfordshire, the Cotswolds, and stuff like that. It's, you know, they're not a maximum, okay. but they're definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and um, but it's a long story to get to where you were. Your, your roe deer population, if you've got a um, high munt population, um, or and fallow as well in the background, it's it's a tough yes. for them. And they, they do well in the summer when they can, you know, the, the, the roe likes to be out in the fields, um, and and they can, you know, can, they can live off what's out there, all the uh, woodland edge and the browse out there, but. Once it comes back to the wood in the winter and they're competing against, you know, good populations of fallow and a high density. Yeah, yeah. yeah it just doesn't, they, they, they kind of just don't stop and they don't thrive. And I, I've had that on, you know, numerous pieces of ground where, but the row that do and, and do get away, haven't got the competition of big populations of row or the pressure sure. of the row books or territory. Yeah, yeah. And we do, you know, we've shot some real good books off ground where there isn't high populations. The Chilterns, for one, is, um, you know, they really struggle to establish in the Chilterns. And we, we used to leave our row um, unless there were, you know, in areas where there were, that, that they couldn't stop, like plantations and stuff like that. But, um, but the books that did get to maturity, you know, six years plus were absolute stonkers. Because they got the minerals in the ground, you know what I mean. It, and yeah, everything. yeah. I mean, they were getting there was good food source that they could get, but mainly they hadn't got that competition from other roebucks that was causing them the stress during the, you know, um, yeah, the sure. of their antler growth. But, uh, but anyway, I'm waffling on. Um, so <laughs> yes, so muntjac is generally what you've been shooting. Yeah, yeah, mostly muntjac. Yeah, yeah, really good populations around here. Obviously, they're just prolific. So um, yeah, they're, they're a staple. It almost guaranteed. It's it's one of my favourite species. I know I've said that absolutely. Many yeah, times. Yeah. I think I say it on every podcast. It's it's such a curious little animal, and um, so you know, with a Monty, if, if you see a row out in a bit of cover, you can stalk them like we did the other night, and you you get the wind right, and you keep your head down and move. 
you can generally get into a position to take a shot. You know, yeah. The Munchak, you might see him a fleeting moment and think you know where he's going, and it's just like the the yeah, yeah. The Munchak burrow. You know what I mean? It's like where's yeah, that? Yeah, they do. They do just a- appear and disappear. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's it's an incredible species, and um, it gets a lot of stick as our alien invader. But I, I think it's provided um, British woodland stalkers with, you know, sport where the props wouldn't have sport. You know what I mean? And it's, yeah, definitely. Yeah. You've only got to see the interest on social media over it, haven't you? You know what I mean? There's, there's um, Facebook pages and, and that, and you see that when people put up, you know, stuff that, that the response it gets and uh, yeah, long may it continue, but we've just got to remember to keep shooting as many does as we can more than the books, you know, and it, yeah, that's it. A lot of the time, you know, having to shoot heavily pregnant does, um, especially for people who um, aren't perhaps hardcore stalkers, they will perhaps leave them and think, oh, let's let the numbers build up. Uh, you know, you've got to keep on top of them. You really have. Yeah, and they are very sweet looking deer yeah. as well. The, the little deer, aren't they? Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you, yeah, enjoy, did you enjoy my Bresciola? Oh, yeah, it's fantastic, yeah. Oh, it's, they're buggers to skin, aren't they? But once you get them off, the, the, the meat of Mundrak is, uh, is is one of the best ones. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is definitely very good, yeah. Well, we've, because, I mean, we've done a call this year because we haven't really had that many clients out. We've done it ourselves, you know, so a lot of the carcasses, uh, and again, every bloody podcast I seem to go back to this, the, the price of venison, um, is, is not, not that good so we've, yeah, we've used a lot of the munchak ourselves so yeah um, I've got three lads so there's plenty to share out but um, we've had to be a little bit more um, adventurous in what we do with it and I kind of yeah, yeah definitely uh, yeah in this one to Chef Pascal's recipe and uh, well yeah. I'm just giving me gout again <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 it, it's definitely like a catalyst for like trying out new things though like having a having a surplus of stuff yeah yeah trying out your jerkies and your bresciolas and whatnot yeah well i thought that well i'm looking at it here um I, I bought this dehydrator and i think it was the best 130 pound i ever spent but i can't it's making yeah. me ill <laughs> about to give it away and leave off it a bit <laughs> yeah. but uh no i mean at the moment we're obviously not shooting any much yet but we've uh we always put loads in the freezer for over the summer and then um, get it on the old barbecue. Um, Tom, my eldest lad, um, minces all the shoulders up. And we actually had a lasagna last night that was... Um, yeah, yeah. I think it may have actually been row that, but we have definitely got Munjack mince in the freezer. Yeah, it's exclusively all we eat now instead of instead of beef, any sort of beef mince. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's all venison now, so... I know. Well, it's Can't beat it. Price. It just doesn't have that. It doesn't have that greasiness. No, to it. that's that's a two-edged sword, isn't it? Because if you're kind of going to make burgers, you have to put a bit more fat into it, you know, or sausages or stuff like that. Because it is, it's that lean. It's blooming, I you know, it's too lean. In, in some ways, you have to bring some bring some fat back into it to get it to bind and stuff like that, don't you? But yeah, it can be. Yeah, it's a tricky one. But hey, yeah. Well, Mark, I've really enjoyed our chat. It's been yeah, me too. Yeah. Too. Uh, as, I, as I said to you on the phone the other day, when I asked you if you'd do this, uh, we'll see you in a few more weeks. Um, yeah, yeah. We weren't that successful. Well, we got a cool book, which is, uh, we got you your first book, but um, he was um, only a little spiker. Um, and Dif- I would difficult like, would difficult like to get conditions. <laughs> Sorry? Difficult conditions. <laughs> Humid conditions. Uh, yeah. we'll get you back in a few weeks um, when the rook kicks off. Uh, I do look forward to that time of the year and yeah. uh, try and give you a bit of a, you know, the roadbook rut experience. Um, we'll just have to sink diaries on that one, but um, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Try, try and get you uh, something that you can hang on the wall and not just make a uh, a knife handle out of. <laughs> Mark, great. It's been as ever wonderful to talk to. Uh, oh, thank wish you. you all the best with your business. It's great to see somebody um, doing something they love and um, and doing such a great job of it. For anybody that's listening uh, who hasn't actually seen Mark's knives, are you at the game fair, Mark? You've gone frozen. Where have you gone to? Hello, hello. Please come back, Mark. Hello, hello. Well, that looks like he's he's disappeared. 
But anyway, um, Mark has got um, a really good website where you can see his knives. And um, if you want to show any interest, in, drop him a message on his website. But thanks again to everybody for listening. Um, I'm going to try and get old to Mark again. Uh, thanks ever so much, Mark, even though you can't hear me. And um, we'll see you on another podcast on another day.